Let's uh, take our Bibles and get them open to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 4, and we're going to be looking in Acts uh, 3 and 4 and 5. may look at some other verses as well as we've been taking a look at uh, some things that I believe in, in, in my heart that, uh, that God um, uh, requires for the church uh, in, in order for him to do some great and mighty works. If we want God to do some great and mighty works amongst us and, and the miracles that we ask for, then I think there's some things on our part that we must do. And we have a, a beautiful example of that here in the early church here at Jerusalem as we start out in the book of Acts. And there's a couple of things that, that they were doing. And we've already touched a little bit on the first one as we talked about them a few weeks ago and last Sunday night as well. And uh, didn't bring it to us in that light, but we will uh, tonight to, to share that with you as we take a look at it. And uh, I think we have discovered uh, some ingredients in the early church at Jerusalem that literally caused God to... to to, uh, for God to uh, power out his blessings or to pour out his blessings in an amazing fashion uh, upon the church and, and, and the body of Christ. And uh, if we look back and go into chapters 1 and 2, you'll find at least three times in there we find that the church was in one place in one accord. They were in one place and in one accord. We find that in chapter 1 and chapter 2. And then we also find that they continued steadfastly in those things that we looked at. In other words, they were faithful, committed, dedicated, and loyal to the things of God, uh, to the work of God, and as a and result of it, in one place, in one accord, one purpose, one mind, uh, and we like to call that with one word that Paul talked a lot about, called unity. When the church is in unity, and we're all on the same page, then God looks down and says, I can do something great and wonderful and mighty amongst them. And that's what he did here with the church of, uh, at Jerusalem. Uh, you read that, you'll find that, that they were in one place, one accord, one place, one accord, one mind, one purpose. Uh, and they continued steadfastly. That means they were faithful and, and, and continued in their faithfulness and dedication and commitment uh, to the things of God and the cause of Christ and the work of God. And, of course, this was an explosion uh, of the church starting out. Uh, as God saw their, remember, they started out with 120 Okay, and, and one of the great and mighty works that God did is on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people got saved. Uh, that's a mighty work. Matter of fact, that's a pretty good day at church, amen? And some mighty works. But if you read the reason, I think because of that, they were in unity, one, person, uh, one place, one mind, one accord, uh, in, in their service unto the Lord and their dedication to the Lord. And so God poured out his blessing upon them. And I know we want the blessings of God on us. We want the power of God on us. And we want to see God do great and mighty works. But we've got to all be in one accord, one mind, one purpose, one, and be on the same page. And so and in order to do that, and God did some mighty miracles amongst them. Matter of fact, you get over to chapter 4, you'll see it tonight, another great and mighty work that God did. You know, everybody talks about, wow, Pentecost, you know, what a day. I mean, hey, 3,000 people got saved, that's a day at church, amen? But hey, man, we forgot about what happened in chapter 4, 5,000 men got saved. That's 2,000 more than, than the women, than, than, than the 3,000. And so we had 5,000 men that got saved. So you can imagine, just think about it, when any time there's 5,000 men get saved, as a general rule, there's going to be women and children around too getting saved. But the scripture gives us 5,000, so there's 8,000. Then you get over into chapter 5, which we'll look at in a little bit. You talk about another great and mighty work that even tops those two. The Bible says that the Lord multiplied uh, 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 a tremendous multiplication of both men and women were multiplied and added to the church. Tremendous amount of people. This is by just time we get to chapter 5. And so you can see there's a great deal of, of mighty works that God is doing amongst the people uh, there at the church of Jerusalem. And again, I think it's one because of the fact that they were in unity with one another. And that was in one of the ingredients. And then the second ingredient that we kind of want to look at tonight here is we want to take a look at it, and that is uprightness in the church. Uprightness in the church. 
And so uh, I think this is another ingredient that we need, and we're going to take a look at it here. So let's begin reading in Acts chapter 4 now, verses 18 through 21. And we kind of see what's going on, what's happening. And, and they called them, this is the religious leaders and the gang and all that, they called the apostles in and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Now this is after the, you know, quite a few have gotten saved. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, and you ought to circle this next two words, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for which was done. Our Father, we thank you for tonight. I ask you to bless our time in your word again. Uh, we ask once again for your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and guide and that he would fill us with his spirit and his power that he would bring to remembrance the things that Jesus has said to us and that he would be our divine teacher and guide tonight and to help us with this, that we might learn that there's some ingredients, I believe, the church needs in order to see God move and work greatly and mighty in the church when he looks down on us, his body, the church, and I believe he does want to do great and mighty things. And so we uh, need to apply these things that we learn uh, from the early church. And so we thank you and we praise you for it. Now give us ears to hear, hearts to feel. And Lord, give us wisdom to apply it as we take in time and look into your word tonight. In the precious name of Jesus, amen and amen. And so... How many of you ever been out and you've been talking to people? I don't care if it's at work where you play in the grocery store, whatever, through your lives, you've talked to people. And the people have said, and you've invited them to come to church. You've asked them to come to church. You've been witnessing them to them to get them to come to church. And big, one of the biggest responses is when people tell you, no, I don't have time. I don't want to go. And after all, I'm not going down there because the church is full of a bunch of hypocrites. You ever heard that? Yeah, now whether that's true or not, that's how they perceive us many times. The outside that we're trying to reach for Christ and bring into the church perceive many times the church, and when we speak of the church, we're the church as nothing but a bunch of hypocrites down there. You see, and that's, a, that's based on what they hear, what they see, what they observe, how we're living, how our lives are, how our testimony is. And, and of course, and, and, and sometimes uh, they see these things and that's how they perceive it and look at it. I've invited some before. Well, that's all right. Come on down, join the rest of them. You know, I mean, and, but in, in all seriousness, you see, what, what, what these men, you see, uh, they had been preaching and teaching Christ and, and, and some great things were being done and yet the crowd comes at them and the Bible says they could find nothing. You see, that's where we need to be. As a people and as a church, we need to be where nobody outside can say they can find something in our lives, in our testimony, or our church. Because we're never going to reach them if they do, regardless of what they feel or think, that's how it is. That's why it's so important on how we live our lives and how we live a testimony and where we go, what we do, how we act, because people are watching. The people are listening. And people are seeing what's going on. And, and if, they, if they can find something, they will. And we need to live above reproach, and we need to have a testimony to where the outside in the world can look at either you or me or our church and say, I can't find anything. And, and that's a good thing. And, and that's what we want, and they couldn't find anything with these men. And so we need to understand it. And then, believe me, uh, when the enemy uh, gets going here, when the, when the enemy examines of the church, uh, they can find, uh, we need to say whenever they examine our church, the enemy, or our lives, they need to be where they can find nothing. Amen. Nothing uh, in our lives or in our church against us. And that's what it was with these men. They, they, they were looking, boy, they wanted to do a number on them. But the Bible said they could find nothing. That reminds me of the good, a good example in the Old Testament is Daniel. How many of you remember Daniel? 
All right, let's look at Daniel here real quickly. In Daniel chapter 6, verses 3 and 5. They're on your study notes, all right? Then this Daniel was preferred above all the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. Now, you got to remember earlier, Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself with the king's meat. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. I mean, King Nebuchadnezzar was going to make him top dog, all right? Then the presidents and princes sought to find an occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, here it is, but they could find none occasion nor fault. They could not find any occasion or any fault in Daniel's life, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. So the boys had to come up with another game plan. See, they couldn't find any fault or error in Daniel's life or Daniel's testimony. But they knew Daniel was a man of God. They knew he was a prayer of God. And so they knew he would pray every day. So since they couldn't find anything wrong with Daniel, they would attack Daniel's God. And so what did they do? They go to the king and they drum up this thing about the king about praying and so forth because they knew Daniel would go and pray three times a day in his window and exactly that's exactly what he did. And so now he's uh, gone against the, 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 the king's uh, command there. But these men said that we shall not find any occasion against Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So that's what they went after. Mark it down. The enemy's out there. That's why the brother Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 34, Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. Now he's talking about the way the church of Corinth was living, and he said, listen, there are people out there that do not have the knowledge of God, and how are you going to share it and tell them with them? Because of the way you're acting and living. Because, boy, if there was anything in any church had a problem, it was the church of Corinth. I mean, everything was going on in the church of Corinth. And so Paul tells them, hey, man, you need to awake to a righteousness and sin not. Uh, because, listen, there are people out there that don't know the Lord. There are people out there that need to get saved. And, and we're going to have a hard time telling them if they feel like we're hypocrites, if they feel like uh, well, they've got something against us, or, you know, we're misbehaving and not living and acting right. That's why Jesus put it this way in his Sermon on the Mount. He said in Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Our brother Peter comes back and says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conversation, that's your manner of living, your behavior. Notice what? Honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you, as evildoers. Now, if you're living, and living like you ought to live and, and having a good testimony and being honest in all these things with your life and testimony, they're not going to be able to speak evil against you. But they're speaking against you as evildoers, that they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So I believe the first ingredient, as a matter of fact, the power of God upon a church I believe is greatly enhanced when the outsiders can find nothing of any manner against us or any contradictions against us or the church. Then we're going to see the power of God. Daniel's a good example of that, and we have others as well. So tonight I'd like us to take a look at just three points here uh, where living upright uh, really counts. Living upright is going to really count in our lives, uh, in the church, and as the body of Christ, uh, and those around us, that we live with uprightness, okay? So one of the first things that the early church here had to deal with, you think about it now for just a minute, all right? And that was uprightness in dealing with success. Uprightness in dealing with success. We need to be very careful with that when it comes to success. Now, some may say, well, I, I don't see a whole lot of success going on and so forth. But, well, you know, if you look at your back of your bulletin once in a while and pay attention to it, I mean, that's some success. Now, that may not be much in some eyes and others' eyes, but in, in my eyes, I think that's pretty good success for our church. And, and, and we need to be careful with that. 
We need to not be blowing horns and tooting trumpets and strutting and roaster crowing and peacocking and all that kind of stuff. We need to give God all the praise and all the glory because God can do even a bigger and greater work. And I believe he will if we have the right heart, motive, and attitude behind it. And so, you see, we we have to learn how to deal with our success. Now, you want to take the early church, as a matter of fact. Do you think they had some success? Well, let's take a look and see in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41 with me. All right, we need to deal with uprightness, dealing with success as this early church did in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, uh, let's see, in verse 41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. I'd say that's pretty successful on the first day of church in Pentecost. That, that's success. And now you got to understand this is 3,000 were added to the 120 that were in the upper room, being led by the, the apostles and so forth. And, and, you know, we could get a pretty big head over that. Say, hey, man, we had 3,000 saved today in our church. Aren't we wonderful? Aren't we fantastic? And well, how did you do that? Oh, it was all the programs we had and all the this and the that and this we did and that and all this we had come in. Well, no, here it was simply that they heard the word and got saved and got baptized, you see. And God added to the church. You see, so what you talk about success, get over to chapter 4 with me in verse number 4. Look at chapter 4 and verse 4. How be it, many of them which heard the word, did what, church? Believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Well, we've just got 8,000 people saved. I'd say that's a pretty good success. That's a great success. Well, it doesn't stop there. Get into Acts chapter 3 with me. Talk about success, Acts chapter 3. You're with me, everybody there? All right, let's begin reading in verse number 1. All right, let's see about, we got to, see, we've got to handle success in the church with uprightness. It cannot be done with pride and vainglory and bragging and all of that stuff. It must be with, uh, we must deal with it with uprightness. So we find here uh, in in the church, again, we're going to see the first miracle. Now Peter and John went up together in the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Okay, it's about 9 a.m. in the morning. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms uh, of them that entered into the temple. Who's seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked an alms? And Peter, fastening his eyes on him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something from them. He was hoping to get some coins or some money here, all right? Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. Now, if we stopped right there, I wonder what the guy was thinking. Oh, great. You know, I thought I was really going to get something from these guys, okay? But such as I have, give I to thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, he lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered in with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Now you talk about a church having great success in the beginning. That's success. 3,000 people, 8,000 people get saved, not counting the women and children, but what we have recorded in the scripture, all right? And now we get a man healed from his birth. Uh, that, that, that's success. I mean, this is a church that's having great success, that God is doing some mighty works and wonders and miracles in the church. Why? Because it started out, they were all in one accord. They were all in one place. They were all in one mind. They were in unity with one another, and God did some great and marvelous work amongst them. And so, brother, if you take a look at here, when God was blessing the church in a mighty way, Oh, my goodness, with people getting saved, people getting baptized, people getting into the church, and now even with miracles. I mean, wow, that's success. That's that's something awesome. None of them had ever seen anything like this before. Well, folks, God can still do it. This is nothing for him. Matter of fact, I'll give you a quote there. All successes of God. Would you agree with me on that? All successes of God. But our response to that success is not always of God, how we respond. You see, we are to be upright in success. Now, if we are, what should success lead us to? Success ought to lead us to the praise of his glory. 
When God does a mighty work amongst it, it ought to lead us to the praise of the glory of God. Look with me in verse cha- chapter 3 with you. All right, everybody, in Acts chapter 3, verses 11 through 13. All right, everybody, in 11 through 13. Here we go. And as the lame man which was healed uh, held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch, and that was called Solomon's greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel... Why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power and holiness we made this man to walk? No, no, look what he says. The God of Abraham and Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. You see, our success, church, should lead us to the praise of God. Any success that we have in this church, anything that God allows us to do in this church ought to lead to the praise of the glory of God. Look in chapter 4 with me. Let's look at verses 9 and 10. All right. If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole? Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. What was Peter doing? He was giving God the glory. Peter said, we didn't have anything to do with this. This wasn't our doings. We're not, we're not gods. We didn't do all this. This is to the glory of God. So you see, any success that we ought to have in your life, Any success I ought to have in my life, we need to give all the praise and all the glory to God. Okay, See, that's how we're going to handle it if we're going to be upright. See, we've got to be upright in in our success. All right? Not only should it lead to the praise of the glory of God, but I think another thing that success ought to do, it ought to lead us to the presentation of the gospel. It ought to lead us to the presentation of the gospel. Back in chapter 3 with me now. Look at verse 19. All right, look at it now. This is after all what's going on, and look what Peter says to these guys. He says, repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Uh, You see that there. Look in chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. All right. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the cornerstone. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You see, their success, they were dealing with it with uprightness because first it led them to give God all the praise and all the glory. And then it led them to present the gospel. That's what it's all about is sharing the gospel. That's what this is all about, is presenting the gospel. Everything on the back of this bulletin is to present the gospel. And to God be the glory. All praise and glory go to him. And this is to present the gospel. So you see, whatever success we may have, however how small or how little it may be, in your life, in my life, in the life of this church, first and foremost, all praise, all glory, all honor, go to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the second thing is, is that we ought to use it to present the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. So you see, that's handling success with uprightness. We need to be upright. That's why we see here in, in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, Paul, look what Paul said to the church of Corinth again. For we preach not ourselves. Folks, this is not about us. We don't preach about us. Now, I've heard a lot of preachers that do. I've seen them take 20 minutes in a 30-minute message, and it's all about them. It's all about what they've done, all about what they accomplished, how they did it, and everything else. No, folks, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Okay, that's what we need to be doing. Success in ministry should not elevate the church. It should elevate Jesus Christ. Whatever ministry and success that we may have in your life as an individual and in our church. And so we need to handle it. Well, there's a second thing I need, we think we need. We need to handle strife. 
uprightness in dealing with strife. Okay, strife is going to come. You can mark it down. When God is at work, hello, Satan always ramps up his work. Mark it down. You go through the book of Acts, I've been going through it and looking at it, and get your pad and write it down, and you'll see that every time, even already in these first five chapters, how many times have they come against them? And, and the devil's popped up his ugly head, ramped up his work, you see. And so we have to deal with strife when it comes into church. I want you to see a vicious attack. A vicious attack. Believe me, Satan always ramps up his work. I mean, repeatedly he does it, uh, repeated daily, uh, over and over again. You see this through Acts where he does that. But Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. All right, let's take a look at that for a minute. We're going to help you go through Acts here tonight a little bit. And they spake unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Here's the attack being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They're preaching the gospel. And Satan's ramped up the work. We're in chapter 4 now. This is after 3,000 got saved. We're close to seeing 5,000 get saved. You know, we're getting close to seeing a miracle. But already after the 3,000 were saved, the devil has ramped up his work and, and, and he's going to cause strife uh, and try to cause it. And they laid hands on them. This is what they did. And they put them in hold until the next day for it was now eve time. For what? Preaching the gospel. Listen to me. All that live godly in Christ Jesus, you shall suffer persecution. Jesus said, in this world you shall have persecution. But be of good cheer, I've overcome. Okay, but we're talking about doing the work of God. We're talking about God doing a mighty work and great work, and all of a sudden strife pops up on the scene, and we have to deal with, with uprightness. Verse 4, how be it many of them which heard the word <laughs> believed, now you see that, and the number of the men were about 5,000. See, in spite of the devil, God still worked. But I believe it was because of the uprightness of how these men handled the situation. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and the elders and the scribes and Ananias and the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Isn't that exactly what the devil does? Every time God does a great work. Now, wait a minute. Uh, how did these 5,000 men get saved? By what power did you do this? Well, simply their answer would be we simply preached the gospel. The Bible says they heard the word and believed. You see, they're, they're, they're getting a little bit worried here, you see. And the church is growing faster than leaps and bounds than you can imagine. Can you imagine 8,000 people now here at the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem? Huh? First Baptist Independent Baptist Church of Jerusalem. Okay, we'll add a little more to it there. Yeah. Amen? You think about it. And so the devil, oh, he, he's going to ramp up the work, boy. Oh, my goodness, he does. John 15, 18, and 19. Jesus said, if the world hate you, ye you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. See, that's why we're not to be of the world, because the love of the world will love us. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. The world's going to hate the church, okay? And, and they already do. And, and they're going to hate you that's in the church. And, and they're going to raise havoc and raise strife and everything else. And we have to deal it with it in uprightness. 1 Timothy 3.12 says, Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own houses well. God's work done God's way using God's word will bring Satan's wrath. Mark it down. I think we've experienced some of that around here in days gone by. Okay, several years ago, one of our ladies, we were walking down the aisle here in the center of the church and said, man, God is moving. Well, we had done eight people had gotten saved. We'd baptized five. I mean, things were, God was moving. And the church was moving. And I turned to her and I said, be careful, be careful. Because watch what will happen. The devil will pop his ugly head up. And he doesn't care who he uses or how or when. And most of the time it comes from within and not from without. Okay. And sure enough, it did. 
You see, and, and so it, it happens, it's going to happen, and, and we're going to have to deal with strife in an upright way. Uh, we got to do that, but I want you to see, so there's this vicious attack, but I want you to see a visible association, a visible association. And I love this one. Go to Acts chapter 4 now with me. All right, we're there, and look at verse 13. Because we're talking about attacks, we're talking about strife, we're talking about how we need to handle it with uprightness. All right, everybody in in verse 13 of chapter 4, I love this. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. I don't think it's too bad to associate yourself with Jesus. I don't think you can find a better person to associate yourself than with Jesus. But listen to me, when you do, you're going to be attacked. They're going to make fun of you. They're going to call you names, Bible thumper, Jesus freak, you name it. These are things that when we grew up with that, I don't know what some of the new names are today by the millenniums and all that stuff, but I mean, they're they're going to do that. They're going to criticize you. You take a Bible to church. You go to church three times a week. I mean, it's, it's going to come. The attacks of the devil are going to come. They really are. But hey, I think associating yourself with Jesus, pretty good thing. That's a good guy to be associated with. Don't ever be ashamed or embarrassed, church, to be associated with Christ. Don't ever be ashamed to give a testimony, to stand up and speak up and speak out for your Lord. You don't need to be ashamed of Him. You can't find anybody better to associate yourself with than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they perceive, and see, that's what the world out there ought to see. We may not be the smartest, we may not be the this or the that, but what they ought to do is say, hey, those people over there are associated with Jesus Christ. I perceive that they have been with Jesus. That's the way it ought to be in our lives. Amen. I mean, see, that's a testimony. See, this is what we're talking about. We need to live a life that's exemplary, uh, above reproach, uh, and and a life, uh, a testimony, so that they can find nothing or say nothing. And all they can say about these men, after all what they've done already, these men are ignorant. They're unlearned Galilean fishermen, that didn't carry a lot of weight, okay? They were next above just the sheep herders, okay? <laughs> that was on the bottom of the list. But we perceive that they have been with Jesus. What a testimony for somebody to say about your life and my life and this life of this church. that They're, they're associated with Jesus and your life. Now, people are watching. See, this is your testimony, what kind of a testimony do you have? It needs to be one of uprightness in your manner of living, your behavior, your lifestyle, your language, your, your talk, you see, your communication, everything so that people can find nothing. Now, you don't have to worry about it. There are people who always come up with something. I mean, you, yeah, trust me, they can come up with anything, but you don't worry about them, all right? You know see, we can't stop. We can, and, and so we see that this is great. They were visible association. I want you to see something else they had. And this is in Acts 4 again and 4 and 5. So we'll look at three other passages. They were visionary aim. They had a visionary aim. Okay, are you with me? Okay, they had a vicious attack. They had a visible association with Christ. And they had a visionary aim. Look at Acts 4, 18 and 20. Everybody? At chapter 4, verse 18. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Now, folks, it may get that way for us. It may get that way where they shut us down on everything. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. Verse 20, for we cannot, say that with me, we cannot Well, what is it that we cannot? We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Church, if we're going to be visionary and have an aim, we cannot stop. We cannot speak. We cannot hide this. We cannot keep this uh, to ourselves. You see, they had an aim, and that aim was to present Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. And that's one of the things we're trying to do with this right here and with everything that goes on with every service here. We're trying to present to the world Jesus Christ, and they can tell us we can't speak in his name, can't preach in his name, but we had better obey God rather than man because we can't help it. 
We can't help but speak in Jesus' name. We can't help but to talk in Jesus' name. We can't help but talk about him. We just cannot help it. You see, amen. Oh, I'm telling you what. They, they, they had a, a visionary aim to present Christ Jesus to others. And so that's in that one. Look at chapter 4, verse 29 with me. And now, Lord, behold, their threatenings. Oh, what are we doing? Here we go, threatenings again. And uh, grant unto thy servants that with all boldness we may speak the word. You see, church, we can't stop. We can't help it. We can't. You see, we need to have a visionary aim, and that is to present the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world by whatever and all means God has given to us. And we just can't. We can't help not do it. We got to do it. Got to do it. Look at Acts, look at Acts chapter 5 with me. All right, over to Acts chapter 5. Let's look at verses 27 through 29. Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 27. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. Oh, here we go again. What did I tell you? When, when God's working and moving, guess what? The devil's going to ramp up his work. Okay, and here he goes again. And they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them. Did you notice all this? They're always bringing brought before the religious crowd. You notice that? Saying, did not, watch this, did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Come on, church, you ought to be shouting, okay? And intended to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. They were visionary men. They had a visionary aim. And all their answers and replies to this are the constant attacks. They did it with character. They did it with uprightness. They did it with a testimony. So that through all this, as you see, they could never find anything against them. After all of this, they still could not. And by the way, you remember Peter, don't you? Before this? Peter, I, I didn't bring this out a while ago, but when we talked about uh, having a, a visible association, there was a time Peter didn't want to be associated with Jesus. You remember that? Huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, Lord, I'll die for you. Oh, Lord, I'll fight for you. I don't care about these other guys and what they, but oh, you can count on me. And Jesus looked at poor old Peter and said, Peter, before the cock crows three times tonight, you shall deny me thrice. Amen? And that's exactly what he did. See, there was a time Peter was willing to die for him. Peter was willing to fight for him as he pulled out the sword, cut off the, the, the temple priest's uh, guard, the ear. I mean, you know, there, uh, Marcus, whatever. I mean, and, I mean, but then, what, what, just in a short few hours, he was denying he even knew the Lord. I don't know that man. Oh, I'm not associated with that man. I, I, I'm not associated with that crowd. That, that's another crowd. You got the wrong fisherman. You know, I look like that's my twin brother. Okay, or it's a clone. No, no. Third time he's warming his hands by the devil's fire, and the little lady tells him, say, yeah, you're one of them. And I'm blankety, blank, blank, blank. No, I'm not. He wouldn't even associate with Christ. But now he said, oh, now he's really ready to die for Christ. And he did. Now he's not ashamed to be associated with Jesus. Don't you ever be ashamed to be associated with Jesus. And if people say that about you, praise God. Give God all the praise and glory that say, man, that lady, that woman over there, that church over there, they're associated with that guy named Jesus, that prophet named Jesus, that Messiah named Jesus. You say, amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah. I wouldn't want to be associated with anybody else but Jesus. Man, and then have a vision. See, we've got to have a visionary aim, folks. The Bible says if there's no vision, the people perish. We've got to have a vision to reach the lost. That's why we need God to do some great and mighty works amongst us. But we've got to have the first ingredients, unity. Got to be on the same page. One accord, one mind, one place, one purpose, all rowing in the same direction, in the same boat, in the same stream. Amen. Then we need to have uprightness. Well, lastly and thirdly, we're done. Uprightness in dealing with sin. We've got to have uprightness in dealing with sin. Amen. All right, I want you to see here in Acts chapter 4. Again, let's go back to Acts chapter 4, verse 32 with me. Verse 32 through 35. Everybody in Acts 4, 32? All right, here we go. Get over here to Acts 4. There we are. All right, verse 32. 
All right, and now they're, 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 they're together here, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart. Talk to me. One heart, one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all, God's favor. All right, are you with me? Say amen. Okay. Neither was there any among them that lacked for as many as were possessors of lands and houses, sold them and brought the pieces of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. What I see here, what happens when there's sin in the camp, there was a gracious love. There was a gracious love of the people. Acts 20, 35. That's what we got to go over a few pages on that one. But look over to Acts 20 and verse 35 with me. Acts 20 and verse 35 here. Uh, there we go, right there. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This church had a gracious love for the people. A gracious love for the people here of this. And this is how they were dealing with sin. Matter of fact, church, everything you and I have and own belongs to him. Everything we have. We're just the stewards, the managers. God's given us everything we have. And don't ever say no because he did. God's given you everything you got. There's no self-made man, self-made woman, and all that kind of stuff. God has given you everything you have because he's given you the breath you have. He's given you the arms, the legs, the eyes, the mind, the body. Everything you have, God has given you. Everything. We're just stewards of it. And by the way, James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. You see, this act that these folks did in the early church, there was no command what they did here. What we just read. You won't find that anywhere in the scriptures where they were commanded to do that. Okay? They were all in unity, and this was a total voluntary act of love on their part. Voluntary act of love on their part. They, were, they had an unselfish attitude among the people. And so this is how sometimes we have to deal with uprightness, dealing with sin. John 3, 27, G John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given from heaven. You, you take a thought, just think about that for a minute. John says you can't, see, you can't receive nothing except it come from heaven. So God owns it all. And God wants us to be generous with it. God wants us not to be selfish. God wants us to help with those that need help. But not only did this church have a gracious love and, and uprightness in dealing with sin, but I want you to see a grievous lie. A grievous lie that took place in the church. Turn to Acts chapter 5 with me. Acts chapter 5. You know it. And by the way, lies, lies come into the church. Okay? Are you with me? Here's in the church now. We're only in chapter 5. Things are just getting started. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. Nothing wrong with that so far, amen. And kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, if that would have been the agreement to begin with, nothing wrong, but we got a little problem here. But Peter said, Ananias... Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie? Now, this is a saved man in church. Hello. To the Holy Ghost, and to keep back part of the price of the land. While it was remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? So why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. See, there was a grievous lie in the church. Deuteronomy 32, 4 says, He is the rock. His, per his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. 
a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. You see, God expects you and I to be honest and truthful with each other. Hello. Ephesians 4.25, Wherefore, put away lying. Speak every man the truth with his neighbor, for we are all members one of another. So there's this grievous lie comes into the church. But then I want you to see a grave lesson. A very grave lesson. Let's pick it up now in beginning in verse number 5. And we just read that, all right? Are you there with me? Say amen. Now in verse 6. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. She probably down to the beauty parlor or getting a manicure, whatever, pedicure, I don't know. And Peter answered unto her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead and carried her forth and buried her by her husband. And here it is again. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Wow. Have we lost our fear for the Lord and the consequences of sin today? Now, somebody says, well, now, wait a minute, Pastor. That's, uh, that was 2,000 years ago at the church of Jerusalem there in, in Acts, and so that doesn't apply. May I say to you, this is the New Testament, Amen. and this is the church age. So God can do it again. You say, God doesn't work that way anymore. <laughs> Be careful with that. Someone says, he doesn't do that anymore. This is the New Testament we're reading out of. The New Testament is the church age. We're still in the church age. It's not over yet. And great fear came upon the church, you see. It was a great lesson. Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. You see, our sin keeps us from the power of God. Our sin separates us from God, fellowship, and and presence. And God is not going to move when this sin is in the camp. Got to get the sin out of the camp, you see. It's important. Well, God doesn't do that. Well, don't, don't tempt the Lord. The Lord does, you see. You had to handle this. See, the, the, the apostles had to handle the sin with uprightness. And all Peter just said and looked at her and said, you know what, you haven't lied to me. You've lied to the Holy Ghost. Why have you done that? Why have you let Satan come into your heart and, and do this to you? And boom, he fell dead. And Mrs. Sapphire, you agree with him? Oh, yeah, absolutely, I'm in full agreement. Boop, and she fell dead. And great fear came upon the church. Upon the church. We are the church of the living God. We are the body of Christ. We are living in the church age. And this is the New Testament. But you see, today, the church, we've lost the fear of God when it comes to sin in our lives and in the church. There's There's no fear of the consequences of sin. But God still deals with it. He deals with it in His way and how He wants to. All right, we're talking about uprightness. We're talking about uprightness in dealing with success. We've talked a little bit about uprightness in dealing with strife. And we've just finished talking a little bit about uprightness in dealing with sin. Paul says to the church of Philippi in verse 15 of chapter 2, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. We're to be shining as lights in a crooked and perverse world and what we're and where we're living. And we must be upright in our conversation, in our behavior, in our living, in our testimony church, so that those on the outside looking in are looking at me and you tomorrow, wherever we may go, listening to whatever we may say, whatever, can find 
nothing. Can find nothing. We may excuse our sin, but we must remember that it is our sin that God exempts us from God's power and blessings. You see, if we want God's power and blessings. See, when we deal uprightly with sin, now watch this, the blessings of God return. How do I know that? We close with chapter 5 in Galatians here, or in Acts. Go back to Acts with me. Acts chapter 5, and I'll show you that. See, the church had to deal with sin in the camp with Ananias and Sapphira. They had to do it in an upright fashion and manner, all right? So they had to get the sin out of the camp. And you remember, you can go back to the Old Testament story of David and Achan. There's another prime example right there. Man, they were, God was letting them beat everybody, kick everybody. I mean, they were having victory after victory. And God says, no, you don't take this. This belongs to me. Achan took it, hid it in his tent. And guess what happened? They sent the next group out, and they got beat up. Till David cleaned out the sin out of the camp. You see, when we deal uprightly with the sin, then the blessings of God return. Look at Acts chapter 5 and verse 14. Everybody there? And believers... Were, were the more added to the Lord multitudes. Did you see that? Both of men and women. See, it went from 2,000 to 5,000 to what? To multitudes. Wow. You see, and that chapter 5 is after chapter 4 with Ananias and Sapphira. So you see. So the second ingredient, as I see here in, in looking at the, the church, the early church, and all that God was doing, and the opposition that came, and the, the attacks and everything, but the fact that the first ingredient they had was they were in unity, one with another. One place, one accord, one place, one mind, one purpose. And God moved in a miraculous way, and great mighty works were happening. Okay? I see that. Then the second ingredient I see that caused God to do that was they were uprightness in their living, their life, their manner, their testimony as they lived. And as a result, when God looked down, he did great and wonderful and mighty things amongst the church. And yes, sin arose and they had to deal with it. And when they did, wow, look at the next thing that happened. And you go through the whole book of Acts like this, and it's just adding and multiplying, adding and multiplying, adding and multiplying, but yet every time something great and wonderful happened, old Splitfoot popped up his head. I mean, he was right there, and we got to deal with it. So, uprightness in the church. Amen. And we need to be upright in our lives and our testimony, how we live, how we behave, our conversation, how we talk. Why? Because people are watching. People are living. You see, we have a testimony. You have a reputation. You know, it takes you a lifetime to build a reputation, and it takes about a split second to ruin it, to lose it, to destroy it. And then it takes another lifetime to rebuild it and repair it. So let's have what the early church had here. Let's be in one accord. Let's be in one mind, one purpose. One place. Let's have unity in the body of Christ. Paul taught about it in his epistles as well, how important it is. And let's be upright in our lives so that everybody out there can find nothing. And watch what God can do. God can do great and mighty works and miracles amongst us. He can our Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for these passages of Acts as wonderful examples for us to look at uh, of the early church and how they started and, and how they dealt with things and, and how things were going and how great and mighty works were happening and miracles. And yes, they had their struggles. Yes, they had problems. Yes, they were viciously attacked, Father, but yet they could find nothing. Yes, the devil popped up, and yes, there was even some lying, and it had to be dealt with in an upright fashion. And God continued afterwards to continue to multiply and to add 
and do great, mighty works. So, Lord, help us to learn from them. Help us to take this serious tonight. And in our life, of our lives as individuals, and in the life of our church. Because surely we would really desire to see God do some great and mighty works amongst us. Lord, may we never become complacent or satisfied where we're at. May we have a visionary aim to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. And may we stay associated with the Lord Jesus Christ. And may those that see and hear around will say, I just can't find anything, nothing against them. Wow, what a testimony, Lord. So we ask for your help, your grace, your mercy, your spirit to help us to live the way you want us to, to live upright, to have a good testimony, a good behavior, so that folks will find nothing. So God, that you will move mightily amongst us. And we will give you all the praise and all the glory, Lord. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord.